Thank you for joining us. We're now approaching the Skybet League One running with Plymouth Argyle sitting in a strong mid-table position in their first season back in the third tier. In a campaign where the Green Army remain unable, of course, to attend Home Park except for a vaccine, uh, these fans' forums take on extra importance, don't they, in terms of keeping the club connected with the fan base. And that's why I'm delighted to be joined tonight by our chairman from sunny California. Good morning, Simon Hallett. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> CEO Andrew Parkinson is with us. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Sparksy. Uh, also joining us, Director of Football, Neil Jusnip. Neil, hello. Good evening, Gordon. How are you? Very well. Thanks for joining us as well. And for the first time, the club's new head of finance. Great opportunity for us to meet David Ray. Uh, good evening yeah. to you, David. Welcome. And, good evening, uh, Sparksy. Uh, a sort of introduction to you, if you like, an informal one. It may be the first time that many supporters uh, have seen you in the flesh or close to it. How are you settling in? Yeah, really well, actually. Um, delighted to be here. Delighted to be such a uh, part of such a brilliant club and a club heading in the right direction, really. It's obviously been a bit of a strange time uh, to join a League One football club in the midst of a pandemic, sat in my living room right here. Um, but no, certainly a challenge that I relish and uh, going really well so far. So thanks to everyone for being so welcoming. A really business-like living room as well it is. And uh, you published your financial reports on the Argyle website, which paints, I think, a relatively positive picture, doesn't it, given the circumstances we're facing? Yeah, I, th I think as I set out in the notes on the website, I think it really represents wh where we are as a club and the direction that we're heading, heading in. And that's the, the right direction and towards our aim of being a financially sustainable championship football club. Um, so to take really the headline figure out of that, that we obviously made a loss of 0.7 million in the previous financial year, but I would stress that that was heavily impacted towards the end of the financial year by the pandemic, obviously, that we've all, the terrible pandemic that we've all been living through. Um, but I think we can be proud of the results um, and pleased that we're heading in the right direction. And really that's, and it's been mentioned a few times on the, the previous fans forums, that's really a large part down to the, the generosity of the fan base. And we're very grateful for that, supporting the club through season ticket purchases, uh, I follow purchases, strong, you know, going to the Argyle store and purchasing goods from there. And also the generosity of our owner with the cash injection last summer. And then I wouldn't underestimate as well just how hard the staff at Argyle have worked um, to really implement our vision and values, which I'm sure we'll come on to in more detail in a moment. But I think very positive results and certainly heading in the right, right direction. Certainly a great team off the field. And I'll get you to chip in with the answer to the first question, which I'll point to Andrew first. Before I put that question, a lot of questions as requested by Plymouth Argyle have been put to the club. But uh, we will hopefully, before eight o'clock, have time for questions that you can put on our YouTube channel. So don't be afraid to put a question there. Hopefully we can get time to fit it in before eight o'clock. So, Andrew, uh, the first question, uh, Russ Moses, Dave Surley and Lob, Noah Bryan, Gary Palmer among those asking this one. Can you confirm an announcement on season tickets for the 21-22 season? And can you foresee a normal season starting in August with fans back? If not, can the club cope financially with another season behind closed doors, Andrew? Wow, quite a lot of questions in, in one question there. Uh, first of all, I think, um, obviously, I think, you know, um, season ticket wise, uh, we're already a little bit later than we normally would have been. But I think uh, this last year would have told us that uh, really, you know, getting it, getting a sort of roadmap, quite literally, of exactly how things will pan out with fans, uh, when they might be allowed back in, we're giving ourselves the best chance uh, if we delay that decision. So it's going to be early May uh, when we'll go on sale for season tickets. Um, so, you know, not too long uh, to go. Um, I think as well, uh, the other aspect to that is, um, you know, it's obviously been pretty difficult um, this last year. I think it's, uh, as David has highlighted, we are in a, a pretty strong position relatively. Um, however, I mean, it's still come back to the fact that we've had 70% of our, our revenue um, has was wiped out really in terms of what we'd normally expect from a match day. So we've had to look at alternative ways of supplementing that income. And 
we've done that in a in a great way. I mean, obviously, as David's already said, you know, the support of uh, the Green Army has been fantastic. But there's lots of other ways that we've been able to uh, generate income. Um, but of course, if we come into uh, another season uh, with behind closed doors, then um, it would still be extremely tricky, you know, quite a precarious position to be in. So um, undoubtedly, we need fans back. And in terms of that, uh, I think we can all see that there's going to be some sort of test events in, in May. And we're obviously all very hopeful that that will lead to crowds being in place. Uh, I think we'll have to do a couple of test events uh, ahead of a new season. So perhaps the pre-season games. But uh, I think we can be hopeful uh, at least that we will have, um, you know, near enough full crowds back uh, if we're going in the right direction as we are now uh, for the beginning of the season. But there's obviously a lot of hurdles to overcome. Things can change very quickly uh, at any moment. So we just need to be mindful of that. Um, Anything you'd like to add to that, David? Yeah, I mean, I would just reiterate the point that, that Andrew made around I think we're, as I said earlier, earlier on, we're in a great place. Um, we're well positioned and um, probably better positioned than many other clubs in terms of our financial position at the moment, and you know how we move forward with this. But it obviously, going directly back to the question, when sixty to seventy percent of your income is based in, as a League One club on on match day income, um, it, obviously playing behind closed doors for a another year for if that was what the question was asking it's it's not sustainable really for any league one club to in the long run to to play behind closed doors um but i think we're in as good a position as anybody if, if i could if i could just add gordon um a year mm. ago when we ran, ran the scenario actually not quite a year ago when we ran the scenario analysis on what could possibly go wrong over the following 12 months given that we were already in a pandemic um you know, I injected some more money into the club that would see us through the worst that could possibly happen. Well, when it comes to the pandemic and playing behind closed doors, the worst that could possibly happen did indeed did indeed happen. We we were only allowed to have very limited crowds for uh, three games, if I remember right. Um, but many other things that uh, could go right did go right. Insurance claims, um, some money from the Premier League, uh, the support of our fans, as David said. So there is actually a bit of a cushion that would enable us to play behind closed doors. Though, you know, really the whole, I mean, in some ways, what's the point of another season uh, where we would be playing behind closed doors? But financially, we'd be able to withstand uh, another protracted period. The, uh, the, ho the whole season would, would be dangerous indeed. Great. Thank you. Uh, Neil, understandably, there will be questions about on-field activities as well. And Graham Clark asks, you recently completed a restructure, Neil, which includes, and I mean you collectively as a coaching team, which includes a playing philosophy across all age groups. And that mm. mirrors across the first team as well. And that philosophy, a 3-5-2 system, maybe a slight variation of it. What underpins your belief that 3-5-2 is best for the playing future of the football club? Uh, well, first and foremost, there's there's no one way uh, to to play football, as we as we all know. Uh, three five two, we've we've bought into predominantly because it's Ryan's favourite system. Uh, but but I think there's an underlying story, really, Gordon, uh, beyond systems. It's it's for for me, it's more about philosophy and style of play. So we we've kind of gone on record very strongly that we want all our teams, from the senior team down to our under nines. Uh, to be possession-based, we, we want to have the ball. Uh, when we don't have the ball, we want to go and get it back as fast as we can uh, in order to have the ball again, obviously. Uh, and we want it to be an upbeat style, uh, high tempo, with lots of action, lots of goals, uh, and, as I say, lots of action in both boxes. Uh, in terms of developing younger players, I've got to say that there's the kind of world-leading models. Ajax, uh, traditionally always play 3-4-3, three, three. Uh, Barcelona play 4-3-3 three, three. Uh, and, and I'm thinking back to my time with the England junior teams, we had a variation on a 4-3-3 on a three, three, which was very successful. So I think it's more about style than, than, a, 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 than actually a structure uh, and a numerical structure in that. How easy is it to teach under nines, that philosophy? 
<laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. It's a, it, it, it's a, a very serious point. The, the, the coaches who work with our youngest players often go unnoticed. Everybody sees uh, the, the older coaches, Ryan, of course, Darren Way with the under-18s. Uh, there is so much work that goes on at the start of the journey uh, that those coaches at 9, 10, 11 and so on through the pathway uh, probably don't get enough uh, rewards uh, and well done's. So formally, lads, thank you. Well done. Brilliant. Good insight. Um, Chairman Bob Wright and Ian Devine are daily mail readers, obviously, uh, because they ask that the mail reported on Saturday that Argyle are among third tier clubs looking for new buyers or significant investments. Can you confirm if it's uh, just a load of baloney from the Daily Mail or is there something in it? I think I'd use a different word beginning with B and ending in uh, X actually, uh, Gordon, <laughs> but I'm not allowed to swear. Um, there is absolutely nothing in it whatsoever. Um, in fact, I was just observing to somebody about 10 days ago that it's been longer than it usually goes before somebody gives me a call and says, would you be interested in um, another investor in the club? So it's complete nonsense. But um, let me just restate what my position is that I've said to everybody who calls. And over the years, there have been half a dozen people who've called um, with an interest in investing in Argyle. Um, I, I always say that I would take any call from a potential investor, um, but I warn them up front that it's almost certainly going to be a complete waste of their time because there's no interest in selling. I don't have to sell. Argyle is well financed at the moment. You know, we, we simply don't, don't need external investors and I have no interest in passing Argyle on to somebody else. There will come a time when um, uh, I'll be ready to pass Argyle on to somebody who uh, I believe can help Argyle push on beyond the level that I'm prepared to take them. And at that point, we'll have more serious talks. Um, but there, there's absolutely no, 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 there's no, nobody's called me for months and months. And um, the people that were calling a year ago seem to have disappeared. So no truth. You can email, email the editor of the Daily Mail and tell him to sort out his sports journalist thing. I think once you start telling people to sort out their sports journalist, you're on a slippery slope to spending your entire time fact checking the local newspaper, uh, fact checking the newspapers, Gordon. It's uh, there, there's just better ways to spend your time. But it really is. It really is a lesson in how much nonsense is in, um, you know, the, is it is uh, published as fact in the newspapers. So, you know, it's not just on investors mm -hmm. and so on. It's uh, there's a whole raft of issues where so-called facts are published that are simply made up. Let's bring in a subject that a couple of fans have raised, Mark Head, John Cooper, Mark Kirsten among them. It's about iFollow, and they ask between them, how important has iFollow been to the club's finances this season? Has it exceeded expectations in forecasted income? And in principle, would the club support continued availability of the service once fans are allowed back in the grounds? And by the way, Alan, uh, Alan Keener sent a message saying thank you your investments in iFollow this season, which is much improved. David, can you share figures on iFollow? Uh, caveated that we've lost all match day income, of course, refreshments, club shop, uh, match day programs, revenue, hospitality. Thanks, Foxy. Uh, I'd like to really emphasize um, just the impact um, and how positive it's been, not just iFollow, but across the board, all of these different revenue streams which we've been able to realise, have they've all contributed to this strong position which we alluded to earlier in the session. Um, with regard to iFollow itself, I mean, to g give you some figures, um, it probably represents about 30% of what we would normally take in terms of match day gate receipts. Um, but what that fails to capture is the other income which you just mentioned, which is, you know, say food and drink sales, hospitality and, and um, sales in the, in the store on a match day as well, for instance. Um, but it's about all of these things taken together. And I know I personally have been blown away by the support and some of the numbers that I've seen of people following these games on iFollow. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And also, I think there's a real benefit in terms of not just direct financial benefits in terms of the purchase of the streaming passes, but it's also an opportunity for, 
the fans to engage with the club and the club to engage with the fans. And um, I know that, you know, Ryan and the team have felt the support from fans watching on iFollow, for instance. And um, it's also, going back to the financial point, it's um, been a good opportunity for for us to to work with our sponsors and our partners um, for, for, you know, to, to showcase Home Park really as a, as a venue. Simon hasn't told me to say this, but have a look at the, the Superstore website. Some of the things on there, the prints, the new prints coming out, they are absolutely amazing. Andrew, um, it's understood Article 48 is likely to be reinstated. That's once fans are allowed back into Stadia, that would mean only international supporters would be able to video stream three o'clock kickoffs on a Saturday with a limited number of fixtures available in the UK. Well, um, I think we're all being canvassed on that, um, you know, all the EFL clubs. So we're very much in the camp that uh, we'd like that to be opened up to all games being screened. Uh, I think, you know, there is definitely two different propositions here. Uh, I think, you know, it's opening up a, a great product for a great game of football for fans to be able to watch, not just uh, around the world, but in the UK is one aspect. But also, if you want to come to the game, having a great fan experience, um, you know, for everybody that comes is a differentiator too. So the two should be able to live together. And we, we, we certainly would support it being opened up so that uh, all the games can be screened. And, um, you know, as, as David has highlighted, that connection can, uh, con can continue for those who uh, aren't able to come to the game. And after all as well, I think you can see the the way that the Premier League has expanded and developed with having TV as um, very much part of its offering. So there's no reason to say why that can't happen uh, amongst the uh, EFL clubs. So we'd be very supportive of, uh, of that uh, sort of uh, restriction being taken away. And Simon, I know you're eternally grateful for the feeds every match day. Yeah, yeah, we've been having a great time. So, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but Gordon and I have been hosting uh, watch parties on Zoom, and we've been uh, we've been making new friends. So, having access to iFollow with all its imperfections um, has has helped us make make some new friends over the season. So, you know, if anybody wants to join in. Um, just contact the club or contact the Argyle Fans Trust, who've been helping us uh, uh, give out um, details and so on, helping us organise these watch parties. That everybody is welcome to come along. We 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 have a great time, and I think it's fair to say that we've, as I say, made made new friends during lockdown. So it's uh, I follow has helped us uh, be a be a make make it a, li a little bit of. I think a, the connection uh, is slightly gone, Simon. But um... oh, sorry. I think we've got, the, we've got the basis of your answer, Simon. Thank you. And I'd like to put the next question to you. It's from one of our American-based supporters. That's Nigel Rick, who says, with the proposed EFL salary cap snow scrap, is it beneficial or prohibitive to Argyle going forward? Have we been handicapped in any way because of the, the deals thinking restrictions would be in place? Uh, if I, if I, I take that one, Gordon, um, initially at least. Um, no, we haven't. <laughs> The, um, our budget for the football side of things was roughly equivalent to where the salary uh, cap, cap was, so it really didn't make too much, too much, too much difference uh, this season. Going forward, um, we've yet to discuss the budget. We're in the middle of our kind of strategic review and budgeting for next season, so we don't know how much we're going to be spending on football next season. Um, you know, let alone whether we, what our revenue base is going to be given the pandemic. Um, so, so far, no, it hasn't really um, had much of an effect on how we have approached transfers, how we've approached everything, everything else. Going forward, um, I think it, it, it's, it, it's one of these terrible on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, and just to remind people, we actually opposed the salary cap initially as um, it was implemented on the grounds that, you know, we have greater resources than many clubs and therefore we felt we should be permitted to spend more on the football side of things. Um, as we kind of came around to thinking more deeply about the impact on us, we realized that it gave us an opportunity to take those extra resources and rather than uh, put them into the football team where we could compete by being smarter um, in terms of our decision making, that we could use the extra resources we were generating to invest 
heavily in the fan experience at home park, in the academy and in training facilities, all of which you know, add up to a better long-term future for the club, though um, obviously restricting us a little bit in, in the short term. Um, now that we're back with financial fair play, it's essentially a system that uh, enables those with greater resources to spend more on the first team. So we'll continue with our progress towards in continuous improvement in decision making. Um, but um, but as I say, we need to think more clearly about what we're going to be spending on, you know, the first first team football next season, and you know, base, basically about resource allocation, which is obviously um, a board uh, issue combined with mm. um, the input from. Uh, CEO from senior managers at the club and so on. So um, uh, we, we'll see how it we'll see how it ends up. As things stand at the moment, I don't think we're either advantaged or disadvantaged. We're back to where we started. And David, as an insight into your role at the football club, this must be something that you and Andrew discuss, of course, with the chairman as well on a very regular basis. Yeah, that's right, Sparksy. And um, you know, we're going at the moment through a, a robust process of strategic planning and. I think Simon just referred to it there, you know, resource allocation. And we, we've got in mind our our aim, which was publicised last year, to be a financially sustainable championship club within five years of last year. And we're putting a plan into place to be there. And part of that plan is making sure that we we have the right budget to be competitive, um, uh, have a competitive playing squad in place. And it's about, at that point, you know, like Simon just said, uh, using data, for instance, to to spend that as smartly as possible. And you know, Andrew, fans being fans, we always like to say, well, let's compare Plymouth Argyle with other clubs in our division. You know, how are we faring? Are we spending as much as them for our success? Inevitably, uh, I, mean, I can't really sort of add much that the other guys have really added other than uh, we're going to do things in the right way. You know, and that's, that's what we all want. You know, we've got a uh, duty to make sure that the club, uh, we're custodians of the club and make sure that it's successful, but also that it's done in the right way too. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, but I'm sure we'll get there. The next question is for you, Simon, predominantly. Uh, of course, anyone can, can chip in as well. It comes from Jordan Malloy, who also wants to thank Simon, you and the board, for your hard work in turning the club around. It's a fantastic time to be an Argyle fan, says Jordan. I feel very proud to see how well we are being run and the question that he would like to put andrew with the stadium redevelopment complete now where do the board see the next key area of development being um i think actually it's interesting the question because the the stadium development is complete but we've only really had um two or three months of actually being in it um in fact i think we've had we've been longer as a nhs center than we have being able to use the facility so um i think there's still some aspects of the development that we would still like to get right operationally so that's that's going to be a focus but equally two other two three other points have made one is uh, around the original development the outside realm area um everyone will know how that everyone will know how that looks and that needs to be addressed it's part of the original planning consent so we'll be doing some works around uh, the front of the Mayflower Grandstand and the and the car park and some of the car parking area. Uh, one of the aspects that wasn't covered off as well within the Grandstand development was the enhancement of the flood lighting. So we'll be looking to cover that off uh, in, in the summer. And then looking more widely uh, and in the future, I think everything that we do uh, moving forward will be about what is best for our long-term future. So things like uh, investment in the academy, uh, will be will be key, and every and, and anything that's really about a uh, long term rather than short term spend, which will allow us to be that sustainable championship club. Neil, I, I guess you want a slice of the cake as well. I know some money has been put into the academy and so forth, and you know we can all see the benefits of that. And 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 I do wonder when we talk about stadium redevelopment, Neil. You you get an inside of you on a match day. Uh, you look into the into the eyes of opponents and their coaching staff. You know we always like to think of of Fortress Home Park. Uh, do, do players, the managers, sometimes not look forward to to coming to Plymouth? Uh, I think we need to make it uh, that fortress that you refer to, uh, Gordon, uh, and, and we do that. Uh, I think by 
uh, by performing well and winning at home as often as we possibly can. I can tell you that it is a very difficult place uh, to come to to try and win uh, because uh, managers and coaches tell us exactly that. They're also always incredibly impressed uh, if they haven't been before uh, and many of them are coming for the first time with the new grandstand of course uh, so it's a very impressive site there is a danger of it isn't there that we actually inspire the opposition to play well because the pitch is so good the surroundings are so good uh, but but at the end of the day it belongs to us and we need to make sure that we make it as tough and as hard as possible for teams to win here uh, we, we try and play a little bit, I think, in the media uh, about the distance that teams have to come to us and, again, turning that into an advantage for us. The next question I want to put to you, Neil, because a number of people have been asking this given recent form on the pitch. Jamie Halpin, Jack Leslie, great name, uh, Trevor Boyd, among those who want to talk about the defence and with defensive challenges that, that we face this season at times. Would the club consider adding a specialist defensive coach to the staff. I remember under the time of Paul Storrock, uh, we had John Blackley as a defensive coach. Can we go back to that sort of structure? Uh, it's quite interesting, isn't it? It's a good time, by the way, to ask the question, given that we got a clean sheet on Saturday. So that, that's good timing. <laughs> uh, and, and I think there's a number of things. Uh, people shouldn't forget we have uh, two of our lone players in the back line. Uh, we lost one or two seniors along the way as well, just in the last transfer window. Uh, so it, it's been a bit uh, chop, chop and change. We have a very young goalkeeper behind them as well. So it was never going to be uh, an easy uh, kind of season defensively. Holding midfield player in front of them as well, I may add, is also a very young player on loan. Uh, but what, what I would like people to know is that uh, the staff have clearly defined roles. Now, I'm not going to tell you who's in, who's responsible for which particular unit here, by the way, but I would tell you that uh, we, we obviously have a goalkeeping coach. We have somebody who spends time with the defenders, somebody who spends time with the midfield players, and somebody who spends time with the front players. Uh, so we don't just have a defensive coach. We actually have four specialist coaches working with the players all the time. That, that time isn't just spent on the training field. It spent uh, working with our performance analysis, Jimmy Dickinson, uh, who works with the coaches and with the players uh, so they can get feedback from their performances in training and in match play. So we're, we're kind of a long way down that track. Uh, I think that's pretty normal practice, Gordon. Well, if it isn't, uh, that's great because we're doing it. Uh -oh. And you're carrying that oh, forward. Sparks, you know, for a minute. Would, would you say, Neil, that uh, you're carrying forward what you had in place last season, you know, to try and press you to a, to an answer from, from those who have sent the question in? I think our structure in terms of staffing responsibilities has, has, uh, has been the same now over the, the period that I've been here. Uh, and I've got to say, I think everyone's comfortable with it. Uh, I think if we've underperformed at times defensively, I would refer more to the age of the players uh, in, in those positions as opposed to the, the, the staffing structure and responsibilities. Just remind everybody that we're hoping to get through some live questions. By live, I mean those that you're putting on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to type in a question on the YouTube channel, uh, we'll do the best we can to get you in before eight o'clock this evening. But we're getting through the questions that the club respectfully asked for in advance of tonight's meeting. And uh, Andrew, a question for you from Matthew Pinney. Assuming that by the end of the regular season, the club have retained League One status, will the board provide Ryan with a good budget to get the right type of players required for the club to have a good challenge for promotion next season? Well, I think, you know, the, uh, the question's already sort of been out there already this evening, really, is that, uh, we we very much uh, are around building long-term sustainability. Uh, we also, at the same time, think we can work smartly uh, and provide not an increased budget necessarily, but the right budget. So we sit down, uh, obviously, with Ryan and Neil, and we work that out about what is the right budget, and uh, that will that will uh, dictate where where we where we do come. So. Um, 
you know, obviously we, we, we will be competitive next season. We will learn from this year and we'll provide uh, the manager and staff with, a, with, with the right budget to be able to be competitive and uh, move on. No doubt, Simon, you want to add to that? I haven't really got much to add, Sparksy. It's, um, you know, we, we, we will not compete by outspending our, uh, 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 by outspending other clubs in the division. We will compete with a mixture of sensible spending and good decision making. And we're making very good progress on you know, generating the resources under normal circumstances so that we can spend enough. But we have to balance the um, uh, the demands of today you know, or next season, the short term against the demands of the long term. And there are plenty of projects at uh, Argar on which we can uh, invest to secure the long term future and the long term success of the club, as well as spending on the first team in the short term. So that, 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 those are decisions that will be made over the next over the next few weeks. When it comes to the current squad, you know, as Neil said, it's young. Um, we've we had a goal this season of surviving, uh, of surviving it both in League One and in financial terms. I think we're we're close. We, we've certainly survived in financial terms. We're financially healthy, and we're very close to being 100% certain that we're surviving uh, in League One. And we've done that with a young squad with a conveyor belt of players starting to come through from the academy, which has occasionally caused problems. But I look upon this as a, you know, a feature, not a bug. It's part of the strength of the club that in a year where survival was our goal, we've taken risks on young players and those young players will be better next season. And that, that's part of our financial strategy as well as our football strategy, that we want an academy that is helping us contain costs by uh, sending uh, players of uh, good enough quality to play uh, League One football. I so think I, think, I, th I think we're making we're making very good progress. Thank you. I, I was going to say I think the range of questions that we've received for this evening uh, are brilliant because they're right across the board. And Andrew, this comes from Michael Wondell, who's been volunteering a number of times for the Mass Vaccination Centre at Home Park. And wonders if Argyle are getting any financial benefits uh, from the success of the centre, or is it primarily good exposure for the for the tremendous community efforts of Plymouth Argyle? Well, we've been absolutely, you know, really pleased to have had the NHS uh, in in uh, the Mayflower Grandstand really since the start of the pandemic. First of, uh, of all, for doing non-essential services, but then latterly as a vaccination centre. And absolutely, it does fit into our uh, vision of values. We're very much a community club and we were asked if we would be able to help out. And that has been fantastic to be able to do that. Uh, you know, in terms of the financial aspects of that, you know, we're obviously get covered in terms of our, our costs. So, you know, heat, light, power uh, and so on. And obviously the, you know, some of the events that we had to cancel. But primarily, it, it, it's about doing the right thing and being able to help. Uh, um, you know, a, a fantastic, um, you know, uh, vaccination centre <laughs> in the heart of the city, really. And David, as finance officer, uh, yeah, great for the community, but does it open your eyes maybe to other possibilities in the future in in renting out the facility? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of things, Sparks here. Firstly, I'd like to say, um, thank you on behalf of everybody and including Michael for, for volunteering and I think it's absolutely brilliant and um, everybody seems to be in that same spirit as the club and it's you know what a great community focused club club we've got and um, the second point that I wanted to raise just on the finances and you've just touched on it we've obviously invested a lot of money into the develop redevelopment of the grandstand and I think you've just highlighted it it presents a brilliant opportunity for us not just on match days to generate income, but also on non-match days, events, and so on. And this is a great example of, of, of what it's there for. Simon, the next question I'd like Neil to, to chip in with as well, but I'll put it to you first, Simon. It comes from Anthony Hogg and Ryan Sonley, who say, we know that Plymouth Argyle are not the only club in this position when it comes to low knees in the division in which we play. We've maximized our use of low knees this season. Is it part of a long-term plan or because of the exceptional circumstances this season, 
And when making loan signings, how important is the possibility of making those loan deals permanent, Simon? Um, if I just get to the second one first, um, when we make the loan signings, obviously it's in the back of my mind that there's a possibility of making them permanent and there's an element of trying out. But you, you, you just don't know when you make the signings what, what the situation is going to be you know, at the end of the season if, if they're just um, signed on loan for the, for the, for the season. So it, it can't really be part of your strategy because you simply don't know, know enough to be able to say. Obviously, if we get a good look at a player, they fit in well, they meet the personality profile and you know, they, they contribute strongly on the pitch, then we will try to, to sign. If if the price is if the price is right, and that brings me to the kind of the costs of having loans loanees, which is why um, they are part of our long term strategy. We're very grateful to the uh, lending clubs to be able to uh, uh, have have these players on loan. But if we do a good job with these young, particularly the young players, we coach them well, we give them playing experience, they increase in value. But of course. Quite rightly, that value accrues to the club that does the lending, not to the club that actually adds the value, i.e. us. So they will continue to be part of our strategy. We will, when appropriate, look to convert to um, uh, uh, contracted players, but it's very hard to predict that that would be the case. But much more importantly, we will be looking to get our own young players from the academy, as I've mentioned. So the loan market is great. It gets players that you know may be more skillful than those we could normally access. But the value that we think we can add through our good coaching uh, doesn't accrue to Plymouth Argyle. And that's obviously what we want in the long run. Neil, a lot of fans regarding loanies will say, well, obviously, we're a football club that has some good contacts with with Premier League clubs, but it's, yeah, of course, but it's not just about that. You have got to do your homework as well. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting market. I mean, I thought Simon summed it up very well. Uh, it, it's a strategy that helps and supports the development of our team and our club for now. Uh, uh, wh whether it suits us further down the line, that'll depend, obviously, on uh, the development of our own academy players uh, how well our current uh, professional players uh, keep going, uh, but but it's certainly an area that we need to be aware of. Uh, thankfully, uh, myself and others within the club have good contacts with uh, not just the, the the leading academies, but indeed all the academies across the country. So it's a resource that we can use if we need to. Uh, but I stress the ideal is, as Simon said, if we are going to take loan players then you've got more than half an eye on looking whether you could potentially recruit them for uh, for the future, for the following season, if you like. I just want to break up the next question into two parts, if that's okay, from Dick Dendle, because, Neil, let's stick with you. Um, he, one of the points that he makes, what will be the recruitment priorities for next season? Do you agree that we need maybe some more seasoned professionals to support the young developing squad? Well, uh, everybody has a view on this, don't they? Uh, th there is no one way for success. There's plenty of role models out there who have done it with very young teams uh, and some who've done it with very experienced teams. I guess the, the ideal that Ryan would like to work towards, having lots of discussions with this uh, with him recently, is a blend. We think we've got some exciting and very talented young players uh, who at times this season might have needed just a little bit of help uh, on the field, help that maybe they, they haven't quite had access to. So that's something for us to consider with our recruitment strategy. But there's nothing better, is the uh, Sparksy, than seeing your own homegrown young players uh, performing well at both ends of the field. Some fans still want Mickey Evans back, but that's a great insight. And, and you're right about the, the homegrown players. And Dick also asks, and Simon, I know you're a fan of this, that the club have signed a contract with Opta, assisting in the development of data analytics for, for the playing philosophy and future playing recruitment as well. Do you want to give a brief resume of how it works for those who don't know and how important you think it is? So how, how it works is that Opta provide data um, about um, 
what happens on the field during a football match about you know num most obviously number of passes who wins aerial duels chances created who assists the chances about expected goals and so on um, and then we've also signed a contract with a group called market insights who act as consultants to help us analyze that data along with jimmy dickinson the performance analyst who's already on staff um, to me, when people talk about data analytics, they often, you know, they often forget what it's for. And to me, it's about making decisions that are not based on emotions, um, emotions which are uh, circumscribed by our own biases, but making decisions based on objective data. So it's all about good decision making. And as I think I've been pretty clear that I may not know very much about football, but I know a bit about running businesses and I actually know a lot about how to make good decisions. So th th this has been one area that I, it's been actually the only area um, when it comes to the club that I've said is non-negotiable, that this club will embrace the use of good decision making techniques. And that involves the use of data analytics. And I've just been thrilled that, you know, actually under uh, under Neil's leadership, that I think um, Argyle has established a very, very strong competitive position in this field. Football is still dominated by people who make decisions based upon gut feel and instincts. And making decisions based upon the facts, um, it, it sounds obvious, but it's something that's pretty foreign to this industry. And I think uh, the competitive advantage comes not from knowing um, about you know, how to interpret data, but actually believing in the importance of interpreting data and actually implementing the processes that incorporate it into recruitment, into analyzing what happens on the field. And I'm, I'm just thrilled at the progress we've been making. I think it gives us a big edge, which helps us, um, which helps us compete, as I said, not just through spending more. Neil, could there be a conflict of interest between Chairman Simon looking at the figures and you seeing what you see every day on the training field when it comes to these analytics? Uh, absolutely not. He's the chairman, Gordon. Thank you for oh. trying. <laughs> uh, well, it's what fans will be asking, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So for for the fans, uh, the the data is the data, uh, as Simon has referred to. We can't we can't change that, and we want to use it. We want to analyze who uh, we should be looking at with a view to signing. We, we want to analyse it in terms of who should be staying in the team, who maybe needs to come out of the team. Uh, and that's not just about football, that's about physical performance as well. John Lucas, uh, our, our sports scientist, is analysing that ongoing all the time. Uh, the, the fans will have seen the vests that the players wear underneath their match shirts, uh, which enables us to do that live. Uh, and, and, of course, football is all about opinions. Every fan has an opinion. Uh, every owner has an opinion. Uh, we, we don't want to lose that, but what we want to do is marry the two together to make sure we make the best possible decisions for Argyle. Something that you'd love to hear, Neil, uh, Adam Randall has just scored for Torquay United, which no Fantastic. doubt will, will please you. And that leads me on to a question. You see how smooth this is from Adrian Jones, <laughs> saying, although geography could work against him, so much for being smooth. Yeah, yeah very <laughs> smooth. What's the option to loan our younger for, for the Argyle first team, uh, especially when we return to the higher standards? We remember Luke, don't we, coming back from Truro City and, and coming back on fire for the first team. Gordon, we missed half of that. Who are you asking? Sorry, to, to you, Neil. I'll repeat the question again. With, with Adam Ryan Law currently on loan, is the long-term solution to prepare young players for the first team, especially when we return to the higher standards of the championship. We remember how Luke came back from his loan spell on fire, didn't he? Yeah. So uh, from when, when we can first register our boys at nine years of age through to 18, uh, there is a fully fledged uh, match and training program. Uh, so they're well served in, in that respect. When they get uh, in and around the youth team, occasionally we'll, we'll have high flyers uh, and, and we think we have some more of those coming up in the next few years who may transfer from the youth team quite quickly into uh, the first team environment 
uh, and, and hopefully kind of get some games and start a great career for Argyle uh, that way. There are others that uh, burn slightly slower, and so we've uh, put together a strategy uh, such as the one that Luke Jeffcott went on where he was loaned out to Truro. Adam, as, as you've just referred to, that's great news, by the way, that he scored and he's doing ever so well. Uh, and it's just another step in the development pathway. We monitor them carefully. Kevin Nanskeville is all over uh, our loan strategy. Uh, if, if he's not watching Adam tonight, I'll be really surprised and he'll report that back in to Ryan immediately. Uh, and then Ryan is best placed to know how Adam is doing or any other uh, young player and can bring them back as and when. Brilliant. Uh, in a moment, we'll get to some of the questions being put on our YouTube channel this evening. But uh, first, a question for you, Andrew, I think from Michael Fleet, uh, who says, I know the club has little control in the view of Michael Uber. I follow, but as thousands of us tune in every week, can pressure be put on those in power to show replays of goals at half and full time on Saturday? Says Michael, the commentator, waxing lyrical about seeing Ennis's two goals. And he hoped we'd see the replays, but all we had was a list of stats and then adverts. Yeah. Look, uh, thanks, thanks for the feedback. I mean, I think it has been a bit of a roller coaster with iFollow this year. And uh, I think certainly it's in a better uh, position than it was at the beginning of the season. But there are still those glitches where we would hope that they'd be able to resolve um, some of the issues that there are still there. So we'll obviously raise that. Um, I think we have been able to demonstrate uh, some improvements on, on the, the product over the course of the, the season. So now uh, people will be aware that we've now got our own bespoke uh, match day commentary and we've got a brand new facility. So it's certainly improving, but there are still areas where it could improve further. And of course, ahead of the new season, we're assessing all the options on our streaming, on our websites, etc. cetera. So um, it will be continuous improvement. Uh, to the YouTube questions, we'll stick with you, Andrew, if we may, because uh, Tom says, will 2021 uh, season ticket holders have any sort of recognition going into the following season ticket sales in May? So, as, as I mentioned, Gordon, we're working on uh, what that proposition would look like. I mean, I, I think, first of all, again, I reiterate the support that we had uh, during the course of the season has been absolutely tremendous. And... Uh, you know, we have that very much uppermost in our mind. So uh, watch this space. OK, uh, just as the next question is fired through to me from Sam, how can we afford to be a championship team, hopefully the season after next, Simon? Uh, what would you say to that? Uh, well, I'm not quite sure how what, what the... Person I've not edited the question. The question. Is, yeah, it I'm not just, quite sure what he's getting at. How can we afford to be a championship team well, in terms of well, finances? Well, so if we think about our revenues, I mean, our revenues in a normal season are going to be somewhere between seven and ten million pounds. Um, if we were playing in the championship, we get another six million, I think, as part of the media deal. And I think we could assume that our revenues from match days would also go up, and our revenues from sponsors. So. You know, if we look at our overall revenues, our overall revenues would increase quite substantially to the point where we think we'd be somewhere in the bottom 25 to 35 percent of championship clubs by revenues, obviously, depending upon who's in the championship at the time. If you're in the bottom, let's let's say it's the worst possible and you're, you're in the bottom 25 percent. So, you, you know, you're 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 18th or 19th um, in terms of revenues. I think that that will um, give us a pretty good chance of staying up if we are able to be clever in the ways that we've addressed about how we spend that money. And that's really what we mean by sustainable in the championship. We mean financially sustainable, as David's mentioned, that our revenues and our expenditures are balanced without need to go to shareholders or other third parties but also that we have a reasonable probability of staying in the championship. And I think that if we're in somewhere between 18th and 12th, let's say, in terms of revenues, then the probability of being able to stay in the championship is, is, is in the kind of 60 to 80 percent uh, range. You know, you only need to look at what somebody like Brentford has done. And, you know, there's Brentford or Barnsley, indeed, who are both clubs that are uh, have been clever about how they make decisions in the way that, I've, I've 
talked about. And uh, they've obviously improved their league position this year into, like, uh, at Barnsley, but also Brentford, who are consistently amongst the leading, cl leading clubs in the championship, despite having a very low revenue base. So I, I, I think it's possible. David, you must have a laptop full of spreadsheets uh, and, and using that wonderful word projections. Yeah, that's right, Foxy. We, I mean, these are things that we've modelled out and looked at what that looks like financially, how we get there. And, you know, I would just add to what I, I agree with everything that Simon said. And I'll just add to that, that, you know, we've got some, we've got a brilliant base to work from with a fantastic stadium, wonderful grandstand, fantastic fan base. Um, I think we've got the platform there. Um, it's about just making those smart decisions and, and using that data to think effectively. Um, Great that we're getting these questions on YouTube live. If you're very quick, we might be able to fit you in between now and 8 o'clock. I know a lot of people are wary about standing on their doorstep in the National uh, Day of Recognition today, one year on from the uh, start of the pandemic. JPRB writes in, Neil, and uh, this is just picking up on the data subject that we we talked about a few moments ago does relying heavily on data take the heat off managers if decisions are being made based on data can a manager be held responsible for results not going the right way neil uh well what i would like everybody to know is that ryan is very very much on board with uh our data kind of uh, analytical uh, philosophy uh and as the manager quite rightly he is at the forefront of every major decision that the football club uh, makes. Uh, it, it would be remiss of us not to involve him uh, and it would be remiss of us not to count uh, on, uh, on his professional view. Would you like, Andrew, I, to come back on the back yeah, of that well, and, and as well? I, yeah. I was just going to add, I mean, you know, Ryan, Ryan is the manager and Ryan and Shuey lead the team. So um, obviously they're completely involved in all aspects. They lead all aspects, you know, in terms of, of uh, running the football team. Uh, and the data is there to help support and inform the decision making that's done. It's not to take, it, take away uh, the role of the manager. I think, so I think where it does, I think where it does take some of the pressure off the manager is uh, in a healthy place, but it takes the short-term pressure off the manager. Short-term results in football are the result of a combination of luck and skill. And people overestimate the role of skill and underestimate the role of luck. And the result is that we see managers getting fired after uh, changed, managers getting fired and a new manager coming in after uh, a period of uh, poor results, which it just to emphasize, are partly the result of bad luck. Um, now, the skill that you have hopefully improves over the season and over the years, but the luck, uh, you know, bad periods followed by a good period. The luck is, luck is, as the statisticians say, mean reverting. And what we want to do with our manager is take away the short-term pressure. Um, you know, our, if, if we, we've already shown it this season, we've had a couple of periods of uh, poor form, of bad luck, where uh, short-term outcomes have been poor and our manager has not been under pressure. We want our manager to make those decisions that Neil and Andrew referred to without worrying about, you know, a goal that hits the wrong side of the post in the 88th minute on Saturday afternoon. Uh, it's important that you make good decisions for the medium and long term, not that you make uh, decisions driven by the need to achieve a certain result on a particular day so i look upon that as again not a feature not a bug of the use of data okay simon thank you neil next one for you um stephen bond wants to know what work is being done with our scouting network are we providing a realistic alternative to our friends in red and white 40 miles up the road given their recent success stories uh, yeah, we're working ever so hard at uh, revamping all our local scouting strategies across Devon and Cornwall. Uh, we believe we've got one or two exciting projects which are uh, literally on the launch pad ready to go, uh, which will hopefully uh, get us access to the best talent in Devon and Cornwall. Watch this space. Nothing else you can tell us at the moment. You know, I'm after a little scoop here. No. 
<laughs> Thank you for the point. Uh, James asks, how excited are Simon and Andrew about the Jack Leslie campaign successes? Well, we've supported, you know, let, let's remember that we um, named the Jack, we named our boardroom after Jack Leslie before the campaign uh, even started. So, you know, we fully support any fan groups that are basically making a statement against ra racism. Uh, we're delighted that they've uh, made the, uh, had the successful fund fundraise for the Jack Leslie statue. We're delighted that the campaign organizers are working with our community trust to educate the schools about, uh, kids in schools about uh, racism. Um, so I'm really excited, not so much about the campaign itself, though that's encouraging, but about the fact that, you know, Argyle fans are embracing the need to make a stand against this foul racism that continues to plague football. Didn't the campaign really take off and, and gather pace in no time, Andrew? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, you, it was just amazing, really. Uh, as, as Simon said, all the things that have happened in quite a, re a relatively short space of time and the coverage that's been uh, gained has been tremendous. And, you know, we've been very supportive from the start and will continue to be so. This would inspire players, Neil, wouldn't it? Yeah, ab absolutely correct. Uh, and we want to make sure that Argyle is open to all uh, and welcome uh, players of all ethnicity uh, who are talented, obviously, who can go out there and perform in front of our fans. Two more questions in the last four minutes before we're, we're invited to stand on our doorsteps. And uh, Lewis asks, is there a plan to boost the fan base within the city, considering the average attendances for the size of Plymouth compared to other cities? That's an interesting point, Andrew. Uh, I, th I think it is, but it just shows you again the opportunity that we do have, you know, changing uh, those supporters or young fans that might have a Man United shirt or a Liverpool shirt and making sure they have an Argyle shirt. And uh, there's, I think, lots of things that we are doing, lots of things we will be doing. Uh, we've uh, obviously got a great supporter base, but we need one that's going to be there for the future. So, Lots of different ways we can tackle that. I, I've talked about the experience on match day. It's got to be there for the community. It's got to be there for young people, but also the way that we engage with younger fans. So it's not a one size fits all that we have a, you know, a relationship with fans of all ages and are able to give them an excitement, something uh, that they they want to feel part of uh, Plymouth Argyle and um, um, part of the city too. So um, it's a great opportunity for us for sure. When we have fans in the stadium, Simon, it's so great to see happy, smiling, young faces, isn't it? The fans for future generations. Ab absolutely. As uh, Andrew mentioned earlier on, we're stewards of this club. We, I mean, you know, technically I'm the owner, but, you know, really I'm, I'm a steward. And our goal is to hand it on to future gen generations. And we want to make yeah. sure that those generations are Argyle fans, uh, you know, not, not supporting some Premier League club up the road, you know. <laughs> I think there may be final question. I'm looking at you using it in Parkinson, by the way. So <laughs> <careful>. you know. <laughs> One final question. And uh, this, this just proves the banter we have in the Zoom watch parties on a Saturday afternoon, a Tuesday evening. Nigel wants to know, and these are the things we discuss in Lulls in Play. Simon, your favourite track by Nick Lowe? My favourite track by Nick Lowe is What's So Funny About Peace, Love and Understanding? seconded only by i knew the bride when she used to rock and roll because you are a massive fan aren't you very big no fan yes i um, think he's, sorry uh, the... he's, a, he's a cool aged person well done um some of you try to get questions in at the end sorry we couldn't get to all of them david i hope you enjoyed your debut tonight and hope you'll return when we do this again excellent thanks foxy and, and thank you neil to andrew and of course simon as well and the media team for putting all this together from home park tonight and we hope that you've enjoyed what you've heard in the last hour it's given you a lot to talk about and in the absence of visiting home park apart from a vaccine that the fan forum has helped you feel more connected to your football club this morning uh, this evening and uh, i know that uh, everyone will join me in saying we can't wait to see you inside the theater of greens again until then uh, stay safe everyone and thanks again to all our participants this evening Thank you, Sparksy. Thanks, Sparksy. Thanks, yeah, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Cheers.